All right, great. So thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. My name is Ryan Carney. I'm the manager of public policy at the Alliance for Aging Research, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The team at Accelerate Cures Treatments for All Dementias, or ACT-AD, was very excited to have you join us for a discussion on research and clinical development in Lewy body dementia. After Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia is the second most common form of dementia, affecting an estimated one and a half million Americans, or between five and 10% of all dementia patients. Lewy body dementia is a disease in urgent need for research and to tools for early diagnosis, biomarkers, and new effective therapies. We are very fortunate to have some of the preeminent experts in this field today to discuss their research to advance our knowledge and ultimately develop therapies for this disease. ACT-AD is a coalition formed in 2005 of more than 50 national nonprofit health professional, patient, business, health provider, and consumer organizations seeking to accelerate the development of potential cures and treatments for all dementias. We have a very full docket of presentations for today. Uh, we have left time for questions at the end of the webinar, and you can submit questions for the presenters through the chat function in the webinar. Before we begin, I would like to thank ACTAD sponsors, Acadia, Alzheimer's Germ Quest, Anavex, Avenir, Biogen, Genentech, Green Valley, Janssen, Eli Lilly, Lundbeck, Merck, and Utska for their contributions to ACTAD. Uh, without their support, uh, we could not run ACTAD. So thank you all. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Susan Passion, Michael Ward, Janelle Germanos and Sarah DiGiovane for helping organize this webinar. I would also like to particularly thank Angela Taylor and Todd Graham from the Lewy Body Dementia Association for helping us organize today's webinar. And for today's webinar, we're going to have Todd Graham, the Executive Director of the Lewy Body Dementia Association, Dr. James Galvin, Professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, we will provide an overview of Lewy body drug development. We're going to have Dr. Jose Bras, Associate Professor at the Van Andel Institute, and Dr. Rita Guerrero, Associate Professor at the Van Andel Institute, who are going to discuss some of the genetic overlaps between Lewy body dementia and other forms of dementia, and, and Dr. Doug Glasgow, Neurologist and Professor of Neuroscience at UC San Diego Health, who will lead us in a discussion on biomarkers at the intersection of Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia. So now I'm going to kick it over to uh, Todd, who will discuss uh, some of his organization's work. Todd, you're on mute right now. There we go. Most common words of, to, of the past year, you're on mute. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you, Ryan and the ACT-AD folks, for the opportunity to uh, participate on this great webinar. Also, thank you all in attendance. Uh, just a real quick introduction here about Lewy Body Dementia Association and why we're excited to uh, be part of this here today. Uh, I guess okay, there we go. So. In addition to our mission of increasing awareness and understanding of Lewy body dementia and the support of those with the LBD and their families and caregivers, we're committed to moving LBD up in the priority for drug development and research and, uh, in general. Given our size and resources, we look to drive research through collaborative efforts among key, key stakeholders. Uh, a little over two years ago, we launched the LBD, uh, LBDA Research Centers of Excellence Program and this initiative has been uh, instrumental in creating 26 clinical trial-ready sites around the country. Uh, it's being headed up by uh, our coordinating center of Mayo uh, in Minnesota through uh, Brad Bobay's efforts. And these sites represent a clinical trial-ready network with critical expertise, infrastructure, and patient engagement and recruitment resources needed for the conduct of LBD clinical trials. The second example of the uh, collaborative efforts we do is the Industry Advisory Council. And the Industry Advisory Council we formed about uh, two, a year and a half or so ago 
And this was created to provide an interactive and informative council of, among researchers, government agencies, pharma and biotech and uh, diagnostic companies who are looking to change the course of LBD diagnosis and treatment. A good example of what we're trying to do uh, going forward is demonstrated by an upcoming webinar we're conducting on January 25th uh, in 2021 uh, from 12 to 4 p.m. Uh, if you want more information, this is going to be on LBD uh, and biofluid and tissue biomarkers, looking at uh, what's going on in the whole uh, biomarker space. Very exciting stuff. If, if you want to uh, find out more and register, you can go to LBDA. Org and click on events and uh, register for that event. That's it. Thank you. We, uh, we again appreciate the opportunity uh, for you all to attend this meeting today, and we look forward to some interesting uh, coverage. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. James Galvin. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine, and I direct uh, the Louis Body Center Research Center of Excellence at the University of Miami. So I'm going to introduce uh, Louis Body as a drug development priority. Uh, so what we're going to do is basically kind of go over a little bit about what Louis Body dementia is and where we are in terms of, of drug development. Um, so I often like to talk about uh, LVD as probably the most common disease that many people have never heard of. Uh, so LBD is the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. Uh, probably contributes to about 10 to 15 percent of uh, irreversible neurodegenerative dementias. Uh, it includes two two different conditions that are very related. Uh, one is dementia with Lewy bodies, and the other is Parkinson's disease dementia. So for Parkinson's disease dementia or PDD. Uh, we have the movement disorder of Parkinson's beginning first, and at least one year later, uh, any other cognitive symptoms can, can begin. Um, DLB, or dementia with Lewy bodies, really can have any other pattern of presentation. Uh, but the diseases share many, many features. They share common clinical features, cognitive features, motor features. Uh, they share many biomarkers. They share pathology when we look at the brain at autopsy. Uh, so we're, we're, we usually talk about them together, uh, the main difference being what came first, if there was a movement disorder first or other symptoms first. Uh, what we know is that at least for Parkinson's disease, approximately 75% of people with Parkinson's disease who live at least 10 years with their disease are likely to develop dementia. So, so this is a common problem, and we think it affects approximately 1.4 million Americans. Uh, it's more common in men than in women. Um, and it may progress more rapidly than what we see in Alzheimer's disease. Now, I never like to compare one disease to another because I don't think that's fair to people who have any disease. But just to give you a sense of the numbers, if we think there's 1.4 million Americans with LVD, uh, what about some other diseases that people know a lot more about? Um, there are about a million cases of multiple sclerosis in the United States. Uh, there are about 800,000 strokes. Uh, in the United States, about 700,000 people with any type of brain tumor, uh, muscular dystrophy, and I'm old enough to remember the Labor Day muscular dystrophy telephones with J Jerry Lewis. Uh, this affects about 250,000 people. Huntington's disease, uh, about 30,000 people. And amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, affects about 12,000 people. Um, so, you know, Lewy body dementia is a more common disease uh, than some of these other conditions, but it's a disease that many people just don't know much about. Um, again, what we know about it from the Parkinson side, um, uh, the point prevalence of dementia in Parkinson's is about 30 percent. Um, it's about a four to six times risk of developing dementia compared to a healthy control individual. Uh, as I mentioned, about 75 percent of Parkinson patients will develop a dementia over time. Um, the mean time from onset of Parkinson's, the first motor symptom to dementia, is about 10 years. Uh, however, there are cognitive symptoms that can appear well before this. So there could be a mild cognitive impairment phase uh, that happens before, before overt dementia. Uh, we know that older age, more severe motor symptoms, and mild cognitive impairment at baseline, and any visual hallucinations seem to be strong predictors of uh, people who with Parkinson's who will go on to develop dementia. 
on the DLB side, um, it's a little bit harder to study uh, because it's a more difficult diagnosis to make and it's often misdiagnosed, um, particularly early on. Uh, but the population prevalence estimates are about uh, you know, zero to five percent in the general population and up to 30 percent when you look at just dementia cases. Um, a recent review of 22 studies uh, reported that the rates are about one to one and a half per 1,000 person years. So, again, makes uh, about three to seven percent of all dementia cases. Uh, but this may be an underrepresentation because, again, it's a difficult diagnosis to make. Um, so, so we, we really need to do a better job of, of defining the cases. Uh, we have criteria now that help us make diagnosis, and so these are published criteria. The advantage of having a published criteria is that allows us to improve the clinician's ability to detect the disease. So for Parkinson's disease dementia, uh, we have to have someone who has established Parkinson's disease, impairment in a cognitive domain. It has to represent a decline from their previous level of abilities and has to interfere with their ability to do their everyday life. Um, uh, we know a lot about supportive features and how we might diagnose this at the bedside. So, so we're getting much better at this. And again, Parkinson's disease lends itself um, to a more readily accessible platform to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease dementia because you already have to have Parkinson's disease. On the other hand, DLB is a much more difficult diagnosis to make, but there are consensus criteria for this as well. So what you need to have first is a dementia, and that dementia typically has very prominent visual, spatial, attention, executive and components. Uh, memory may be impaired, uh, but may not be as impaired as you might expect, say, in Alzheimer's disease early on. Uh, and then there are what we call core features. So these are features that are really key to the disease. They typically occur early in the course of the illness. Um, this includes fluctuating cognition. So these are changes in attention and alertness, um, recurrent visual hallucinations, typically well-formed of little people or furry animals, uh, something called REM sleep behavior disorder. So these are people who act out their dreams um, and features of Parkinsonism. So slowness, stiffness, or gait abnormalities. Uh, so these things can occur. And so, Typically, we look for at least one, if not two, of these core features. There are also a number of supportive features. So these are features that are common in Lewy body dementia, but they're not specific. So they could appear in other conditions, so you can't use these by themselves to make the diagnosis, but they can really help the clinician determine whether they think that this is the cause of the underlying uh, cognitive problems. We now also have uh, criteria for prodromal Lewy body disease. So these are people who don't yet manifest the dementia, but may have other symptoms. And we know that some of these symptoms can occur years to decades before. So for example, people can have Parkinsonism before they have any other symptoms, right? But they can also have REM sleep behavior disorder 10 or 20 years before they develop any other symptoms. And in fact, if you look at someone who develops REM sleep disorder, there's a high statistical probability they'll go on to develop Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or a more uncommon disease called multiple systems atrophy. And last, we also know that autonomic complaints, so um, lightheaded when changing position or chronic constipation or changes in their sense of smell, these things can occur many, many decades before any other symptoms. Uh, so, so we know that some of these features occur very early, and so this has allowed researchers now to recently define uh, three different types of presentations that may represent prodromal or, or precursor stages. Uh, this includes a mild cognitive impairment stage, much like we have for Alzheimer's disease, a delirium onset presentation. So these are people who have no known problems. They get admitted to a hospital and they have a period of confusion or they have a significant illness and they have a period of confusion that eventually clears up. Many of these people may actually go on to develop Lewy body dementia. And we can have a psychiatric presentation, so people who have unusual neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, that appear first, this may be the harbinger of future Lewy body dementia. So I like to think about this as sort of grouping all these symptoms into bins, because the bins help us understand the disease a little better. So in the middle, I have the pathology of, of Lewy body disease. 
Um, and so these are Lewy bodies under the microscope. We can only see these at autopsy at the present time. Uh, doc, later on, Dr. Galasco is going to talk about some of the biomarker development to see if we can detect this pathology in living people. But right now, we can only do it in the people at autopsy. Um, and so related to the presence of Lewy bodies, we can have four sort of bins or categories of symptoms. So first, we can have motor symptoms. So slowness, stiffness, that gait imbalance and falls, a uh, tremor, uh, and they can have irregular jerk-like movements called myoclonus. So, so here's our motor symptoms. Uh, we can have cognitive symptoms, and so visual tracking, visual attention, visual perception, uh, initiation. So you can notice visual appears in a lot of these things, and so many people will go, go to the eye doctor first because they're seeking a diagnosis for what their problem is. But in fact, it's not their eyes, it's their brain uh, which may have difficulty interpreting information. We can have psychiatric and behavioral symptoms, so visual hallucinations, again, typically small people or furry animals, but they can be other types of hallucinations, tasting things, smelling things, feeling things, hearing things. Uh, delusions are false beliefs, uh, paranoid thoughts, misidentifications. Uh, people can have depression, anxiety, and apathy, and of course, this REM sleep disorder that I mentioned before. And the last are these constitutional symptoms, a loss of smell, constipation, urinary incontinence, uh, runny nose, drooling. Um, so, so all of these symptoms by themselves may be difficult, but when you start to look at it like this, if you started having or seeing someone who has a motor symptom and a psychiatric symptom and a cognitive symptom, this allows clinicians to maybe put things together to, to make a diagnosis. Um, we can also look at neuropsychological testing, so that pencil and paper or computerized testing that looks at different areas of cognition. And we can develop these profiles so that what we see in Alzheimer's disease is different than what we see in Lewy body dementia, and these are different than we see in other forms of cognitive impairment. So clinicians and neuropsychologists can use this information to help us make a diagnosis uh, of Lewy body dementia. Last few things I'll just mention is that it's important to think about what the family's experiencing with this. Uh, we interviewed almost 900 uh, caregivers uh, to find out about the diagnostic experience. And 78% of patients were diagnosed with something other than Lewy body dementia when they first presented. Now, some of these were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. And while it's not technically right, it's not really a wrong diagnosis because it's how they presented. But more importantly, uh, a number of people were diagnosed with psychiatric diseases or they received no diagnosis at all. About two thirds of the patient had to see at least three physicians and diagnosis took up to 18 months. And, and the diagnosing physician almost always was a neurologist. Uh, and if you live in a big city, there are a lot of neurologists, but if you live outside of a big city, the pool of neurologists available to you may be uh, markedly reduced. In terms of treatments, and that's going to be the focus here, is uh, there are no treatments approved for DLB in the United States. So everything we do is considered off-label. We borrow medications from other disciplines to treat all of the different symptoms of Lewy body dementias. Um, so we use the medicines from Alzheimer's to treat some of the cognitive symptoms. We use the medicines from Parkinson's disease to treat the motor symptoms. And we borrow other medicines as well. We know that these medicines work because of in the, you know, investigator-initiated studies, but they're not indicated for the use in, in most of these uh, instances. Uh, there are a number of clinical trials that have, have gone on. Um, for the most part, the results have not been uh, particularly fruitful. Um, so they're either negative or uh, they're positive, but it's a small signal. Um, most promising is a recent approval of, of medicine uh, called pimavanserin, uh, which helps with uh, hallucinations and delusions and other psychotic features, first in Parkinson's disease psychosis, but more recently across multiple different dementias. Uh, so we now have improved tools to help patients and their families with some of the symptoms. But there are a lot of trials ongoing, and this is important because we need to have identify more effective medications and as Dr. Galasco will mention in his talk with biomarkers, we need to figure out better targets. Um, clinical trials for Lewy body dementia remains a top priority uh, in the uh, Alzheimer's disease 
and related disorder recommendations. Um, uh, however, most of the trials really don't address the full range of symptoms. They're primarily focused on symptomatic approaches rather than trying to modify the underlying disease. Um, and to date, almost no trials really have addressed a lot of these very disabling and disturbing symptoms for patients and their families. Um, we recently got together and published a paper thinking about optimizing the clinical trial design. Um, and that's all of these little bullets here. So understanding the study population, figuring out what we want to measure, the primary and secondary outcomes, how to design the trial, what other comorbid conditions are going to affect that, how we're going to recruit people, biomarkers and genetics are going to be the focus of the next two talks, and how we're going to recruit people and engage them and develop regulatory planning. Just before this talk, I did a search on clinicaltrials.gov, which lists all of the active studies. So if you look at Lewy body disease, there were 106 registered studies, 76 were interventional, and 30 were observational. But only 12 of these studies are currently active in recruiting, and only three of them are drug. So clearly, there's an unmet need to try to improve our ability to develop, design, recruit, enroll, and complete successfully uh, clinical trials in Lewy body dementias. So to tie my section up, um, the Lewy body dementias include Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, and these really only differ by the initial presentation of symptoms. The clinical criteria are highly specific and correlate strongly with pathology, but they can be somewhat unwieldy to use in general practice. For the present time, our symptoms are largely are, are treatments are largely symptomatic, um, and there are really very few active trials of therapeutics, and very few of them potentially disease-modifying. So this is a clear unmet need and the focus of what we're talking about today. Um, so we need new targets and better targets. We need better biomarkers. We need better outcomes. And we need capital investment by industry and NIH to do these studies. I want to thank you for attention. I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dean. This, this was a great presentation. Um, and and um, I had uh, a few slides uh, on the introduction that I probably won't be able, won't, won't need to use. But um, so, so let us start on, on the genetics. So my name is Rita Kairo, um and together with Jose Braz, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about our work on the genetics of dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, we are both associate professors at the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in this uh, short talk, um, we want to give you a very uh, broad overview of, of some of the main genetic findings in the LB and also try to contextualize this with what is known for uh, AD and PD. And I'm, I'm going to refer to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in this way, um, most likely throughout the, the presentation. Um, so, uh, as, as, as Jim said before, um, something that not everyone realizes is that DLB is actually uh, the second most common form of, of dementia. Um, there are over 1.3 million uh, people uh, in the U.S. living with this disease. Um, the clinical presentation may resemble uh, PD or AD, um, and this makes, makes it difficult sometimes to, to perform the, the diagnosis. Um, in comparison with these two diseases, it's also a relatively young clinical entity, um, with the first cases being diagnosed in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, when the disease was initially proposed to be a separate entity. Neuropathologically, it's characterized by the presence of weird bodies in brain tissue, uh, a feature that is also shared with, with Parkinson's disease. And all, many of these factors altogether have, um, have actually contributed uh, to what we think has been uh, a neglect uh, in the study of, of dementia with Lewy bodies that you can see in the bottom figure there. So this, this plot is just showing us the number of, of publications um, on DLB, uh, on Parkinson's disease next, and on, on AD uh, on top. Um, and I think it's, it's very clear that the number of papers uh, have been uh, really uh, really different between between these diseases with the bottom line corresponding to to DLB, um, and this is particularly evident for uh, for papers and for studies um, of the genetic component of, of this disease. 
and it, this is, is something that we are now working hard to, to overcome. So the truth is that when we study the genetics of the LB, we do face some additional challenges. Um, so so these, um, these studies include, um, in addition to, to a difficult diagnosis, the, the frequent existence of copathologies, uh, also the difficulty for one individual center to have large enough cohorts, large enough groups of patients and co co controls uh, to perform meaningful large-scale genetic studies. Um, additionally, there aren't many reports of, of families presenting with, uh, with DLB in several generations, and this, this makes it difficult to perform the typical um, genetic linkage studies uh, that have actually um, been the basis of the identification of, of the Mendelian genes that we currently know are associated with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And when the LB uh, is present in families, um, many of the family members actually present with other neurogenitive diseases, and this all complicates the interpretation of, of any genetic findings. Still, uh, we um, currently know that genetics is a significant component of, of the LB, um, but most of the studies that have been conducted so far over the years uh, have focused on, on single variants single genes uh, or in, in small families or cohorts. So um, the vast majority of the LB cases are sporadic. Um, there are only uh, a couple of examples of fully penetrant DLB causing mutations. Um, the genes historically involved in DLB are uh, alpha cyclin uh, and APOE, the apolipoprotein E gene. Um, the first one uh, is also associated with Parkinson's and the second with Alzheimer's disease. Um, nonetheless, there is uh, growing evidence that a significant genetic component contributes to the LB, and that this component has some overlaps with uh, both AD and PD, but overall, um, th this component represents a distinct genetic profile when compared with, with these other diseases. So, very briefly, I just want to mention a couple of aspects that I think are very important uh, associated with cyanuclein and APOE in the LB, the genes that I that I just mentioned. So starting with, with cyanuclein, uh, overall point mutations and copy number changes in, in this gene uh, are rare causes of, of the OB. Um, but patients with cyanuclein replications with point mutations uh, at positions 40, 46 and 53 of the protein uh, can frequently present clinical and pathological phenotypes that include the OB. So uh, very recently, a novel mutation in, in this gene in cyanuclein, um, in, in this position 83, and that's, that's the report that it's represented here in this slide, um, the, a novel mutation was, was identified in a family presenting with the LB. And, and I wanted to show you this, uh, this family because it is a great example of uh, significant intrafamilial phenotypic diversity. In this case, we have a family with AD, FTD, PD, and the LB uh, all present uh, in the same family, and some entities like the LB and PD confirmed in the same individual. So this, this type of findings exemplify um, the difficulty in assessing pathogenicity of variants. Um, variants that are identified in genes that we already know uh, are linked to, to the LB or to a specific disease, and this, this difficulty is, is um, exacerbated when, when we use exome sequencing or genome sequencing analysis to try and find new genes and find new variants, <clears throat> because then we, are, then we are assessing thousands of variants um, in one case, and it's much more difficult to, to pinpoint the exact uh, mutation that is causing the disease in, in, this, in these families. So uh, regarding APOE, um, this is the only replicated risk focus that is shared with Alzheimer's disease, uh, known until now. Uh, the E4 allele of the APOE gene is known to be a strong, the strongest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's highly significant in all AD genome-wide association studies, for example. Um, and in the LB, the, this same E4 allele uh, is also very significantly associated with the risk of disease. Uh, and we showed it to, that it, it, it's also associated with a shorter survival span uh, in the LB uh, patients, and that's what you can see in this uh, image here, in this Kaplan-Meier curve uh, in the bottom of the slide. 
where carriers of two e four uh, apoE alleles have a significantly shorter survival uh, than non carriers at the same time, the e two allele, another version of the gene, uh, is also known to be protective for alzheimer's disease, and we also see the same the same thing for for the LB. more recently uh, novel genome wide uh, technologies and also uh, this paired with the work of international consortia uh, that are that are able to bring together samples uh, from people living with uh, with the LB from around the world uh, have allowed the identification of other genes, other genetic variants, other genetic factors associated with the LB. Uh, and Jose will go over uh, some of these now. So thank you, Rita. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the, some of these results that Rita um, alluded to just now. So one of the things that I think is worth mentioning is this uh, large study that we've conducted just over a couple of years ago, um, really performing the first genome-wide association study in the wiggly bodies. Uh, so a genome-wide association study is um, a study where we compare the genetics of cases uh, versus uh, healthy individuals, and then if there are variants that are overrepresented in one of the groups, we can determine that they're associated with disease. And so we performed this study, um, as I mentioned, um, just a little over a couple of years ago, and we were able to bring together through an international collaboration um, just over 1,800 DLB cases um, and just over 5,000 controls, really making this the, the largest genetic study in DLB um, ever conducted. And so the bottom uh, panel to the left there shows the typical results of, um, of a GWAS study. Um, each dot there represents a, a variant in the genome, and they're placed on the X axis according to their position in each one of the chromosomes, and on the Y axis according to their uh, association. So that the higher a dot is, the more associated it is with disease. And what you can see is that two of the genes that we mentioned, cyanuclein and APOE, uh, were identified um, as being associated uh, with the LB in this study, but also that additional um, genes were also found to be uh, associated with disease. And so this really, this was, this was, was very exciting um, results because it really showed us that genetics is important in dementia wiggly bodies, even in the common forms of dementia wiggly bodies. So one of these results was at alpha synuclein, and when we looked at alpha synuclein with a little bit more detail, uh, because alpha synuclein, as we know, is also strongly in, associated with Parkinson's disease, what we saw was that although the gene is associated in DLB, the SNPs, the variants that are associated in DLB, are different than the variants that are associated in Parkinson's disease. And so, although the, the same gene is involved in both diseases, DLB and Parkinson's, the way in which it is involved is different. And to us, this suggests that there is a different disease mechanism um, um, or a different control of, of, of alpha synuclein or something um, involved um, in, in these two diseases. And so we had a, 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 a closer look at, at this, and what we found was that um, in DLB, the SNP that we see as being associated with disease is actually uh, controlling the expression of alpha synuclein through. Um, the antisense gene that is uh, located next to it. And so the, the risk allele in DLB um, is actually associated with an increase of alpha synuclein expression. And this is, of course, interesting because alpha synuclein, as we know, is the, is the major component of, of Lewy bodies. Now, these are kind of preliminary results because we're only able to do this in a small data set, but the results were, were very suggestive in, 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 in showing that this risk SNP. Um, controls the expression of alpha synuclein at least in, in some brain tissues. So the GWAS also allowed us to um, better characterize the overall genetic architecture of dementia wiggly bodies. We were able to um, quantify the amount that genetics seems to be involved in DLB, and we found that to be you know, similar to what we know exists in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, which is a substantial amount uh, of, of, of this involvement of genetics in disease. And we are also able to say that Although DLB cases seem to have um, higher genetic risk from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, that genetic risk isn't predictive of DLB status. 
And we didn't find this to be very surprising because some of the genes uh, that were associated with DLB are also present in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease with dementia, APOE, and alpha synuclein. And there are others, GVA, for example. Uh, but the fact that they don't predict DLB status is interesting and kind of suggests to us, um, again, that DLB seems to be um, a unique disease um, when compared with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And the other factor, one of the other factors that supports this idea is that when we look at the other genes that we know were initially associated with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, and so MAP tau, for example, was one of the first genes to be associated through genome-wide association studies with Parkinson's disease, and the same thing for CLU um, for Alzheimer's disease, we don't see any evidence of association for these genes in dementia with Lewy bodies. So this really suggests that there are similarities, surely, between these diseases, but DLB seems to be, from a genetic perspective, um, kind of a unique, um, a unique disease um, on its own. And so that just brings me to the conclusions of this, of this presentation. So there's clearly a genetic component to DLB, even though we, we don't frequently see DLB in families as we see um, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And this uh, may bring us back to the misdiagnosis issues that um, Dr. Galvin and, and Rita mentioned before. Uh, the, but, but even in these cases that are not familial, genetics plays a role. Um, and that's an interesting result to, to have. There are certainly overlaps with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease genetics, but overall it seems that DLB has a, has a unique architecture. Um, the association of alpha synuclein is very interesting to us, and this is something we're um, trying to understand better now. Um, and also, as we continue to perform these studies, other loci and other genes will surely be identified for DLB as they were for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And so with that, I'll just um, leave the acknowledgement slides here. And I'll just um, hand it over to Dr. Galovsky to continue the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Jose. Um, so I'm going to cover biomarkers. And in particular, um, we've heard that uh, DLB, while it has um, a number of defining criteria, um, can overlap to some extent with Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's can be accompanying pathology. Um, so I'm going to cover some aspects of the relationship between the two and some things that are distinctive for um, DLB. Um, to start off with, um, there are many ways to decide whether a biomarker is going to have a clinical use or not. The FDA developed a framework called um, Biomarkers, Endpoints, and Other Tools, or BEST, and um, they define in very clear terms different context of use for biomarkers, and I would encourage people to look at this. Um, as one example, um, diagnostic biomarkers could be used in the clinic or in clinical trials for patient selection. Um, then there are a number of different applications that are mostly in relation to clinical trials. Um, and again, the biomarker data I'm going to show could apply to several of these instances, but we have not yet seen examples um, from successful DLB trials um, <clears throat> showing that they actually um, fulfill these needs. So if we think about um, biomarkers reflecting pathology, um, at the heart of DLB is alpha-synuclein pathology, which um, is located in brainstem and um, limbic and cortical areas. And there also may be co-pathologies, Alzheimer's, um, which would be amyloid and tau, and vascular pathology. Some of the ways we might detect this would be to directly measure these proteins or to look for markers related to neurodegeneration, for exa example, synapse loss, markers of circuit dysfunction, um, imaging probably being a very useful approach, hypermetabolism and cell death. We may want to look at biomarkers of cellular processes that have been implicated in Lewy body dementia and possibly Alzheimer's. Um, I've listed some of these up here. And then synuclein pathology is systemic, and there, certainly the Parkinson's field and to an extent in DLB, there are opportunities to look for biomarkers, not only in um, spinal fluid and blood, but also in salivary glands or um, skin biopsies. So let's start with synuclein. Uh, much work has gone into measuring <coughs> levels of total alpha-synuclein in CSF as a biomarker. 
And a number of studies show that it is decreased in DLB as well as Parkinson's and MSA, which are the synuclinopathies. Um, however, there's an extensive degree of overlap with results in normals. Levels of synuclein, interestingly, are slightly increased in with jakob disease and in Alzheimer's disease. And one of the problems with um, <clears throat> measuring alpha synuclein in CSF is that blood contamination of CSF results in increased levels and makes the marker difficult to interpret. Um, more recently, there has been a major effort to try to <clears throat> detect abnormal forms of synuclein, and in particular forms that can contribute to biological or pathological seeding. Um, and the idea of this is to set up a seeding assay in which the sample is added to a microplate. Um, if the sample con uh, contains seeds, then various um, cycles of shaking and relaxation get it to interact with recombinant synuclein, which is now a fuel, and thioflavin is thrown in. Um, and at some point, if um, enough aggregation occurs, a more complex aggregate forms and the scoops up thioflavin and fluorescence can be detected as a readout after a lag and then there's a maximal um, <coughs> reading. And several variants of these assays have been developed, including RT-QUIC and PMCA. Um, there are a fair number of studies published in the last three or four years. I'm just going to show some of the data. Um, and these are data showing um, alpha synuclein RT quick or PMCA in CSF. This was one of the first studies of PMCA in Parkinson's disease, showing that um, in the synuclinopathy um, there was very high sensitivity for PD. Um, there was also sensitivity for DLB, and um, very unusual to get a positive reaction in a normal control. In fact, some of the normals in these um, studies subsequently um, actually developed Parkinson's disease. Um, a recent study was published looking at DLB, both autopsy-confirmed DLB with accompanying AD, as well as clinically-confirmed DLB cases. And in this study, the sensitivity and specificity for detecting DLB um, were both <coughs> over 90%. So this would be able to serve as an excellent diagnostic biomarker and very recently, data has emerged looking at RT quick on skin biopsy, which also looks exceptionally promising. Um, we've heard about APOE, for example, and about the question of Alzheimer's disease copathology. So in CSF, we can measure A beta 42 and tau to develop um, biomarkers reflecting an Alzheimer profile. And this is a study from a large cohort um, from a clinic um, at VU Medical Center in Amsterdam. In their setting, 40% um, of patients with DLB had CSF biomarkers that indicated Alzheimer's disease. Um, the mini-mental, which is a um, rather crude index to follow patients with over time, did show decline without a prominent difference um, for people who did or didn't have an AD profile, but there was a marked difference in the interval to nursing home placement or the equivalent for people who had concomitant Alzheimer's disease as shown in the figure. Um, so that's a very brief survey of um, biofluid biomarkers. And in the remaining time, I'm going to touch on imaging. Um, it's possible to do all kinds of different imaging and assessments of the brain. And with regards to DLB and trying to identify whether Alzheimer's disease may be contributing or not, a number of approaches may be used. FDG PET um, has been most widely used in relation to DLB, and there's a characteristic signature of occipital lobe hypermetabolism, and there's a way to look at this in a very particular cut, which gives rise to the cingulate island sign, a relatively preserved little blip of metabolism in the cingulate. Um, MRI uh, does not show much atrophy in LBD. It does show um, hippocampal or other areas of atrophy when there is significant contributing Alzheimer's disease. And then one can do um, molecular imaging tests such as um, amyloid PET. This was a study from Mayo Clinic in which they were able to segregate using combinations of imaging um, patients who had Lewy body dementia or pure AD or a hybrid of uh, AD and LBD. Um, if one looks at amyloid PET, another way of trying to detect um, Alzheimer copathology, um, again, this is a large series from Mayo, um, somewhere in the, in the literature about 50 to 80 percent of patients with DLB will show a positive amyloid PET scan as um, 
as depicted on the left. And in this particular study, about 60, um, almost 60% were positive, a slightly lower um, PIB index. Um, the total amount of amyloid binding was a little lower in DLB than AD. If people did have concomitant amyloid in DLB, uh, there was an accelerated rate of cortical atrophy measured using MRI, looking at a number of different brain regions, not just Alzheimer regions like medial temporal lobe, but interestingly also the temporal and occipital lobe. And higher PIB retention at baseline was also associated with a work, clinical worsening on CDR um, sum of boxes. If one looks at hippocampal atrophy and APOE and survival, clearly these would be Alzheimer-centric biomarkers. People who had um, the APOE E4 allele and hippocampal atrophy had worse survival or more rapid decline in dementia with Lewy bodies um, regardless of age at onset. So um, the consistent theme is that concomitant Alzheimer's pathology um, accelerates progression measured clinically or with biomarkers. And so, um, again, I'm presenting only a brief survey of a very complex and exciting field. Um, I'd like to state that biofluid and imaging markers are complementary in dementia with Lewy bodies. Pathological alpha-synuclein can now be detected using measures such as RT-Quick or PMCA in cerebrospinal fluid and potentially skin biopsy. Brain imaging with FDG-PET can support a diagnosis of DLB. Amyloid PET imaging um, or CSF biomarkers can be used to evaluate concomitant Alzheimer's disease pathology. And as several studies have shown, concomitant Alzheimer's disease is associated with more rapid progression in DLB, both clinically and on MRI. And so if we think about deploying biomarkers in clinical trials, I think there are a number of potential uses they can be used to try to assess the kinds of pathological lesions present in the brain. They can be used to improve diagnostic accuracy and can be used um, as prognostic indicators in trials. And um, we so far have not seen much longitudinal biomarker data, but hopefully um, they can be also deployed for target engagement and to get some sense of outcomes. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Um, so now we are in the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if there are any questions that you have for the presenters, and we've see, received a few already, um, you can submit them through the chat box in the webinar portal. Right. Uh, so the first question, uh, how can patients and advocates keep up to date on the latest uh, LBD research? Where should I go to learn more about participating in clinical trials? And I think that is probably best for Todd at this point, but if anyone else has anything to add to that question, um, you can uh, follow up after Todd. Um, with regards to finding up finding more information about LBD research. We constantly post on the website, lbda.org. There are updates on what's going on. We also actively um, provide information about participating in clinical uh, research for uh, patients and their families. Um, so that's kind of checking back on that and looking, looking for information. We also get involved in recruitment of uh, participants in clinical trials, in which case we will outreach to uh, our audience in various ways, either through uh, our Facebook postings or email blasts or things like that. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we just had another one come in. Uh, I suppose this is for anyone. Is there a particular reason why LBD is more common in men than women? Uh, 
I'll, I'll address it, and I guess uh, if uh, Doug wants to add in, he can. Um, so we don't know exactly why. It appears that Parkinsonian conditions, so Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, and related disorders are more common in men, about 1.6 to 1, so uh, 1 1.6 men for every woman. Um, and that's about the exact opposite of what we see in Alzheimer's disease, where it's about 1.4 women to every one man. So Alzheimer's seems to have some female predominance, and Parkinsonian conditions seem to have some male predominance, uh, and we don't fully understand the reasons why yet. Right. The only thing I would add is that, um, and again, the geneticists can probably give a better answer, but um, you know, we've wondered if there are aspects of um, genetic regulation of some of these proteins or biological processes. And but so far, there are several theories, but nobody has come to a um, concrete or definite explanation. Um, and certainly, there's a lot of ongoing research in this area. Echo that. I mean, it's it's an area of interest. It's an obvious um, difference, and we can't really understand it from a genetic perspective yet. There's a lot of research going into to this. Even in these large studies, we haven't really been able to understand it yet. So I'll just echo what what was said. Great. Uh, next up, what are the biggest barriers to having more randomized clinical trials in the space? How can advocates encourage more RCT specific to the unique features of DLB? Just chime in first and other people can join. I think uh, there, there are a number of challenges and one is identifying a good target for therapy. Um, and so that requires more research, and more research requires more research funding to do more research. Uh, the second is biomarkers. So how do you identify that your drug has met its target? Um, and so biomarkers in uh, Lewy body diseases are far behind what we see in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so more research is needed in that. Um, and then third is the outcomes. And so uh, how do you, once you figure out that you have a marker and that you have a drug, how do you measure whether it works? Um, and so a lot of the tools that were developed were developed for Alzheimer's disease and, may, and they may not be fully appropriate for Lewy body dementia. So uh, we have a target problem, we have a biomarker problem, and we have an outcome problem. And all of us here on this panel and many, many other people are working on how to address those issues. Anyone else before moving on to the next question? If a family member is diagnosed with LBD, what action should a sibling take to determine if they will also get the disease? Take a first stab at that and then let the clinicians uh, take over. So from a genetic perspective, um, not much. We haven't seen genetics really playing a role in this familial in familial form. So, if you have a diagnosis of DLB, or if your sibling has a diagnosis of DLB, um, there isn't much that genetics can say in terms of your risk or what you should do, uh, if anything at all. Um, and this is slightly different to Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, where we know these diseases. Sometimes it's a small percentage of those cases, but they occur in families. And you know, Mendelian mutations, uh, fully penetrant mutations, give rise to the disease. In, in DLB, we haven't really found many of those, with the exception of the alpha cytokine uh, mutations, and those are exceedingly rare. So, from a, a genetics, from a molecular genetics perspective, I would say that there isn't much that, that you should do. Right. I, I would echo that. Um, there's a lot of interesting we hope that that helps to inform us about potential mechanisms of disease um, but right now we wouldn't use genetics um, to inform family risk the only rare exception would be if a family comes along where um, multiple members have things like DLB or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's 
um, in the background, and then we might have a long discussion about how and whether to pursue additional genetic testing. But again, we would start by testing symptomatic people and not asymptomatic relatives. I thing I would say is that, uh, you know, if, if you, a uh, family member or a friend has uh, a disease and you're interested about your own risks, so first is do everything you can to manage your own health. Um, and so make wise lifestyle choices uh, staying mentally active, physically fit, socially engaged, eating a healthy diet, managing your other medical risk factors. And two is consider participating in a research study. So many research studies are looking for people who are cognitively normal um, and are willing to participate in biomarker studies. Um, and if you have first degree relatives that have a disease, the geneticists, while there are no genetic links now, the fact is that much more research is needed to be done. So I would say consider participating in a research project. And so we have two questions left. Um, so one, uh, a few weeks ago at the CPAD conference, there was an announcement that a phase two study met its primary endpoint for patients with mild to moderate dementia with Lewy body. How has the Lewy Body Dementia Research Community been reacting to this announcement? Well, I, I hate hogging the microphone, but I'll just throw in first, and I think Doug wants to go too, is I think we're excited, right? Uh, the fact is that some uh, a phase two study looks like it met its primary outcome, makes us encouraged that the phase three study should go on, and we'll hopefully we'll encourage other companies to jump into the fray uh, and begin programs with pipeline drugs uh, for DLB and Parkinson's dementia. So I, I think that that's exciting and, and we're very encouraged by that. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to make more of a phase two study than I should. The, you still need two confirmatory phase three studies to demonstrate that it works, but we're excited. Right, and not, not much to add, um, you know, other than that this, um, you know, the mechanism of action of this particular drug is interesting, and if this bears out into phase three, this would um, provide a very different avenue supporting um, how cognition might be modified in relation to um, DLB. We don't know if this particular drug is... Um, acting on pathways where it could be disease modifying, where it could slow progression. Again, lots of further research to be done, but I would echo Dr. Gelvin by saying we hope that this really stimulates further efforts um, by the research and pharma community to get into the field. Yeah, and I, just, I would just like to add to that too. Certainly any step in this direction is a, is a positive step. We at LBDA are excited because this was one of the reasons we brought forward uh, the uh, Research Centers of Excellence. We worked with, in that case, EIP Pharma and helped identify centers for the study to be conducted. We helped them recruit, and we are, um, uh, as, as Dr. Galvin said, we are hopeful that uh, such success will be continued on to the Phase three part of, the, of research. We just have one final question. Uh, I have three first degree relatives who have passed away from LBD. Uh, my daughter has been diagnosed with ANS dysfunction and TOTS. Is there any consensus that individuals with TOTS eventually show evidence of neurodegenerative disease? Um, so um, I'll take that. I think um, POTS is. Um, a relatively recent entity, it hasn't been as well studied as it could be, and it may have a number of different factors that contribute to causing it. So um, if you have um, POTS, you might or might not have anything um, wrong with synuclein-related pathways. Um, the rest of this family history, however, sounds as though there is something um, going on in relation to genetic susceptibility and um, you know, going back to the previous question we had, this would be the kind of thing that um, you know, probably should be discussed with a um, untreating 
um, physician, in particular um, a treating physician who has resources to counsel and perhaps get people involved in genetic research and testing. Great. Well, I think that wraps up today's webinar. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today, and especially our presenters who provided uh, four fantastic presentations on uh, Live by Dementia Clinical Development and Research. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the ACTAD Coalition, uh, my contact information is at the bottom of the slide. Um, you can contact me at rcarney at agingresearch.org. Um, and this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ACTAD website uh, within the next two weeks or so. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, we look forward to your continued engagement with the coalition.